Welcome to the 100 Master Coaches series featuring Master Coaches from around the world. Let's journey together on this 100 Master Coaches series with your host, Coach Mel, MCC. Philippe Rosinski is a pioneer in world authority in executive coaching, team coaching, and global leadership development. He is the first European to have been designated Master Certified Coach by the International Coaching Federation. For almost 30 years and across continents, Philippe has helped people and organizations thrive and make a positive difference in the world. He is the author of two seminal books, Coaching Across Cultures and Global Coaching. Now on to the show. Hello, hello, and welcome to the 100 Master Coaches Show. This is Coach Mal, and today my special guest with me is Philippe Rosinski, and he's from Brussels, Belgium. Welcome to the show, Philippe. How are you? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mel. I'm fine. What about you? Nice, nice to be with you here today. Yes, it's a pleasure. You know, um, what is Belgium like right now? I know it is a beautiful spring. Uh, beautiful spring, I wouldn't say today it's raining, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it could be nicer. Oh, yes. And um, once again, it's just a privilege to have you on the show. I'm just going to jump in right into our first question, Philip. And it's often asked. How did your coaching journey begin? Would you like to share? Yes. Well, it, it began um, over 30 years ago when, wow. in fact, I started uh, as an engineer. My background mm. is in engineering. I studied mm. in Belgium, then went to Stanford University, uh, mm. studied engineering there. And my yeah. first job was in the Silicon Valley as an engineer. Wow. And, uh, came back to Europe, worked as an engineer, as a manager. Mm. Something that struck me is often the human potential is underutilized. And that's mm. really unfortunate. Also, I noticed several examples of leadership that were not always so great, it seemed to me. Ah. And so I had the sense that something could be done to help make a better use of human potential. Mm. And, um, and then I began on a, on a journey which eventually led me to uh, to work as a as a coach um, i see wow would you like to dig a little bit deeper into that journey how you make that choice and that shift because i'm sure there are a lot of people who are also maybe in that transition right they are thinking hmm, like you human potential well, is yeah. something i like to go into yeah. but i don't know where to start yes well at the time Coaching certainly here in Belgium did not exist. So <laughs> the journey yes. for me was, I, I went back to, uh, to business school and got a, mm. a degree in business management, yeah. learned a lot of interesting things, but including about um, human resources, but mm. nothing about how to make a better use of people's potential. And yeah. the journey involved a lot of self-study, attending yeah. a number of seminars and mm eventually joining a company um, as an independent where mm. I started to work as a trainer, um, leadership development trainer, communication trainer. Mm. And once I did that, the next step was to realize that you can only do so much with training. It's also interesting to work with people over a period of time. And so yeah. I developed a program. It didn't exist, but I developed a program of working with people over a one-year period, meeting wow. with them one-to-one -one and helping them to articulate uh, personal objectives where they mm. would want to be in a year from now. And so yeah. I started to work as a coach and I didn't know that what I was doing was actually coaching. It's only a few <laughs> years later yeah. that I was invited to speak at a conference yeah. And I was invited as a coach. And so that's the first time I thought of myself as actually being a coach. <laughs> that is a, a very strange world, if you don't mind me saying, because here in this year, 2021, right? Coaching is synonymous to human potential, human development and all that. And in back then, it was fairly new what do you think are some of the different changes that happen in these decades coming to where we are right now 
Well, you know, to some extent, I think uh, there is still a lot to be done to mm. ensure people can use more of their potential. So, sure. uh, of course, a, a big difference concerning coaching is that coaching was not known. It was only at the beginning, yeah. also in the U.S. at the time. Yeah. And it's only later I discovered the work that had been done in the U.S. Now, coaching is much more institutionalized, yes. much more recognized yeah. as yeah. a legitimate field. So I think that's a, that's a big difference. But there's still a long way to go before uh, uh, coaching can penetrate society more broadly and before people can use uh, their full potential. We still have a long mm. way to go. Mm. Mm. Some progress has been made, of course. Definitely. Philip, there is still a way to go with coaching. What would be some of the hindrances, perhaps in the organizational space of today? I think in, in a way, coaching, it starts oftentimes uh, with the top of the organization that needs to understand what coaching needs and what mm. coaching can bring. Yeah. So there has to be this readiness to, uh, to embark on that journey, which also requires courage. And, yes. and humility, notably on the part of those in charge, they need to be willing to question themselves. Um, mm. if, if we don't want to just apply coaching in a superficial fashion. I mean, yeah. to tell you a story, I was invited by a firm, an international firm actually based in the US and, mm. and they called upon me to, um, to help them put in place a, a comprehensive leadership development program, which included eventually it ended up including notably training as well as coaching uh, yeah. at different levels in the organization but i mm. remember the ceo asked me about ensuring that this would bring an impact and mm. then i challenged her and said you know i would need her uh, to ensure that this has an impact her yes. personal um, involvement and when she would speak to people that she would not just deliver a kind of a standard speech, but she would speak from personal experience, she would be ready to engage herself on the journey. Mm. So that was mm. one of the condition, her personal yeah. involvement. Yes. And the other condition was to clarify what do we want to get with this coaching? What are some of the objectives? What do you expect to gain from coaching? So we can design an intervention that included, yeah. again, not just coaching, but training that will help the organization move into that direction. But yeah. I guess that involved a journey for her as well, as well as her leadership team. And not all top teams are ready to uh, question themselves in this way. Sometimes they will expect, Absolutely. you know, the middle managers or the young people yeah. to, to go under some change, but not the people at the top. <laughs> You are speaking very familiar things, Philip, because, you know, I'm we sure, talk yes. about coaching culture, right, in organizations and always, you know, it has to start with the top management, not just the leader herself or himself, but also the C-suite, also the N-1, because they have to, in a way, walk the talk. Well, <laughs> yes, and, and to be a, a bit... Um... I mean, to, to play the devil's advocate here. Yes, and at the same time, the, I've been involved in projects where the top management was not necessarily ready to embark <laughs> on the journey, but there was, mm. for example, one person in the organization, a middle manager yeah. or a VP, yeah. who decided to make a difference. And then mm -hmm. I think a lot can be done there too. So I understand. Uh, the question is, what can you do at your level to make a yeah. difference for yourself and for others? So... You don't necessarily need to wait for the top people to change of course. for you to embark on the journey because those who uh, go on the journeys, I would say they, they go on the journeys for themselves first. They will have mm. a personal benefit from embarking in this coaching journey as well as being able to promote some positive changes around them. And so I've worked um, with um, on some projects like that where it didn't start from the top, but yeah. nevertheless... One example I can mention was the work I've done with um, a gentleman named Peter Leyland. He was a, a VP at Baxter at the time. And he promoted some amazing change in the company. His success was then featured in the Sloan Management Review. And wow. that became an example for the entire organization. Wow. So he started the club, but it started with a VP. Very nice. I remember 
that conversations I've had with uh, another coach. And that is exactly what happened as well. Some organizations start from the top. Some organizations start from the place that needs it most. And then, of mm -hmm. course, there are champions, as what you were saying, right? Champions yeah. within places where they will be the ones that role model the change first to themselves <laughs> and then to their places of influence. That's beautiful, Philip. It's, um, you know, if we wait for others to play their mm -hmm. part, we are going yeah. to wait forever. So <laughs> when I would coach somebody, it's really about promoting personal responsibility as well as empowering people to use their potential yeah. so that they can um, fulfill their potential and they can become really responsible. So yeah. as opposed to, I'm going to wait for the politicians, <laughs> the CEO, these or that. <laughs> Absolutely. Be the change that you want to see in the world. I like that. I will. like that. <laughs> um, Philippe, over the last oof, 30 years, as you were saying, with you being involved in coaching, what would be three top insights that you want to share on this show today? Well, one insight would be, we just talked about the importance of um, promoting personal responsibility. What I think coaching can do is help people live a more purposeful life and yeah. leave what I would call the autopilot mode where our mm. choices are dictated by <laughs> whatever cultural norms exist around us. If we can... Yeah take more charge in our lives, I think we can have a, a more um, joyful, a more mm -hmm. meaningful life for ourselves, as well as being able to promote positive change for others. I think coaching yes. can help achieve that. Yeah. Uh, but the second point I want to make is there is a need today for what I would call global coaching. It's an mm. integrated form of coaching which I think is better suited to address the complexity that we face. Mm. Traditional coaching tends to rely on, you know, one school of thought, one model, one discipline, one perspective, or just a few of those. My invitation and the approach I've developed calls mm. upon a variety of perspectives, ranging from the physical all the way to the spiritual. It's an mm. invitation to learn also from, if we just look at the cultural perspective, to learn from different cultures so yeah. to broaden our horizons to not just do more of the same but to mm. to be curious and eager to learn from different cultures different uh, disciplines and when we do that yeah. we are better equipped to address complexity not just from one perspective but from multiple mm. perspectives i think that mm. is needed today and that is i guess the the second insight i would like to share with you the Thank third you. insight would be that yes at the same time, I think we want to learn about different disciplines, perspectives, different tools. So we have a, um, a big toolkit. <laughs> so we are not just relying on a hammer um, yeah. to, you know, to fix nails, but we are better equipped to address a variety of challenges. But this being said, at the heart of coaching is a personal relationship. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to just mention Martin Buber, who contrasts I eat relations with I do relationships. Mm -hmm. When he talks about I eat, he means objectifying the person, describing the person. Whenever we do that, and I think it's useful to do that, we use tools mm -hmm. to do that, we provide some useful knowledge, but we also are limiting the person in front of us. And we fail to realize that we also exist in the relationship. Yeah. I do has to do with turning to the person establishing a deep human bond with the person. We are beyond all these models. We are just there <laughs> um, genuinely connecting with another yeah. human being. Yeah. And I think that is really critical for powerful coaching. So powerful coaching is beyond just a transaction. It's a human encounter. And we need to be prepared to meet the person as a unique human being and, and build this strong human connection. That is at the heart of coaching, mm. beyond all the techniques and models, which matter but are not sufficient. Mm. I'm just sinking in at what you're saying, especially with the two last points that you mentioned. One is the openness to invite other 
models, other modalities uh, in a global perspective, right? Because that is so key towards diversity and acceptance. And then, of course, the third point that you said was, wow, um, allowing us to move from just the transactional, right, into that transformational through a relationship that bond that humanity in each one of us. Wow. I'm sure that you've got a live example, and I know I'm asking you off the cuff here, of how perhaps a human bond that happened between you and perhaps a coachee of a different culture. My first book is on coaching across cultures, and, and yes. I guess... One of the, the goals here is to understand cultural differences, mm. uh, not just visible differences, but yeah. to appreciate that we have different ways of thinking, different ways of communicating, of managing time, of engaging in various activities, just having that awareness. Yeah. And it's not just a matter of understanding and appreciating differences, but what I try to promote is the notion of leveraging differences, of making the most mm. of differences. Wow. And one way to achieve this is when you meet somebody is to ask yourself, and, and I tend to do that actually, um, what can I learn from this person? Uh, what yeah. are some of the gems I can learn from this person? And I suspect that's what you are doing too, Mel. I mean, with your interviews, you have that yes. same curiosity. You are interested in meeting people around the world yeah. and and you have genuine curiosity in meeting them yeah i think that's um that, that then um cultural differences are everywhere but i it's no longer an obstacle it becomes an opportunity really yeah and that can as happens i was in haiti for example i had the <laughs> the, the chance to to wow. work for doctors without borders and i went there and i worked with some medical directors, uh, local medical directors. It was a, 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 an amazing human bond that we were able mm. to establish. Uh, it was typically when I, I coach people, we meet regularly, but then there it was different because it was kind of a crush course, <laughs> not a course, but a crush coaching. I was there for a week and the idea was yeah. coming very frequently yeah. face to face. Then we continue there on. But that has also been the case with... Uh, People I've met in Japan, uh, in China, in um, uh, Latin America, even recently in Russia, actually, uh, uh, I, this was over Zoom, um, hmm. but I had a three-day seminar, I had a three-day seminar, the title is Leading and Coaching Across Cultures, and this was done with simultaneous translation. So oh. it's impossible, even over the distance, to establish that bond yeah. and even though we're not speaking the same language i have to say there was an excellent interpreter there but all it requires is uh, a desire to connect to the other person to yeah. turn to the other person and if the other person reciprocates then that's that's all that is needed and that mm. happens to be the case typically in this seminar that i mentioned we have people yeah. who come here with a spirit of openness and curiosity and that is happening all the time in those programs. And so participants leave the program saying, I've experienced what I've learned. I've experienced mm -hmm. the richness of cultural diversity. Now I really get it. I get it that, hey, we started being different people with some, of with some challenges, and we ended up being a powerful team, more creative coming mm. together. And I look at the world today, and I know that we are painfully suffering some of these issues systemically with the acceptance of differences that we all have with one another. How do you think coaching can play a part to be somewhat like the glue <laughs> to connect? Yes. Well, coaching, I would say coaching across cultures, just traditional <laughs> coaching is probably not enough. Mm. Need, for that, we need coaching across cultures and global coaching, I would argue. Yeah. I think it helps in raising a level of consciousness in people, a mm. sense of awareness. Yeah. Unfortunately, 
still too many people view culture in a static way. I've been raised in this way. Those are my values. Those are my norms. Those are my beliefs. And that's the way it is. Yeah. We need to move beyond that. We need to understand that culture is something dynamic and inclusive. Yeah. Yes, we have acquired certain norms, values, and beliefs, but we are not stuck with those. We can continuously expand those, not necessarily yeah. giving up our norms, values, and beliefs, mm. but enriching them by learning from other cultures. And yeah. we need to think in terms of and versus or. So it's not such a matter of giving up my cultural preferences, but it's a question of including a different perspective yeah. so yeah. there is a mutual enrichment. Let me give a concrete example. Mm. If, um, for example, I've been raised to be direct, straightforward, I believe that it's important to be clear. I don't need to, be, to give that up, but I can appreciate that there is another form of communication, um, which is called indirect communication, which is about yeah. preserving harmony and showing yeah. nobody lose face. Yeah. I could have the best of both worlds. If I learn to be clear and sensitive at the same time, if I learn to speak clearly, mm -hmm. but the way I deliver my message is sensitive, yeah. then I've achieved the best of both worlds. I don't want to suggest that it's always possible, yeah. but I would argue that there are many more opportunities like that when we can have the best of both worlds, yeah. but we first need to raise our own awareness about mm. what are our cultural preferences, then we need to appreciate that others may have different cultural preferences. And it's a matter of learning how to bridge the gaps in a mutual enrichment dynamic. That yeah. I think is what is needed if we want to promote not uniformity, uh, which would be a bland version where <laughs> we eliminate all the disparities, but unity, true unity, which is a synthesis of differences mm. where we can make mm. the most of differences. And I think coaching across cultures, not just any form of coaching, but coaching that would integrate this cultural perspective can actually play a key part in promoting this. As I said, there is a long way to go because um, still a minority of people are even aware of the fact that something like coaching across culture exists. Mm. And those who see the title may think, oh, that may just be reserved for people working internationally. I think still few people have a concept of what we are just talking about. But if more yeah. people knew about this, were trying, um, I think we would be better off. Thank you. Um, it leads me to my brave moment. What do you think, Philippe, over the last 30 years that has been your bravest coaching moment? I guess one thing is I faced like all of us, some hardship in my life. And, um, yeah. and being brave means that I accept what I cannot change and I never despair. Uh, so uh, I continue to do what I, wherever I can to, to change the situation and I accept whatever I cannot change. So that I think is mm. being brave. And there, there have been times like that in my life over the 30 years uh, mm. um, where that has happened. Mm. For the rest, I, I think... Um, what I would not consider brave, really, is uh, the fundamental change I made 30 years ago. Uh, but there was a moment where, after all these studies, you know, going to Stanford, which is one of the best schools in engineering, um, yeah. and doing well there, actually, and then realizing after all these years that, in <laughs> fact, I'm going to turn around completely. I'm going to yeah. do something very different. Some people told me, if you'd like to train, maybe you can become a technical trainer, you know, train <laughs> some people for engineering. I said, no, that's not what I want. So yeah. I started from scratch. But I would argue that that, is not, that was not really brave um, mm. because it was according, if I may say, it's as wow. if I didn't have a choice almost. I, I wanted to do this and that really prompted me to, uh, to go forward. And, uh, wow. and I guess, uh, so... Maybe something else is having the, the readiness to push the envelope. Mm. Oftentimes, um, I've heard, uh, you know, coaches or trainers or educators training, teaching a certain way to coach, a certain way to do things. I've always, I think, been open, but also have a crit have had a critical mind. And I, it seemed to me, for example, that the cultural perspective was not part of coaching. And so it was important to integrate that perspective into coaching. And so that's what I set out to do. 
I, I cannot say that it was brave again because it seemed <laughs> necessary for me to do that. Yeah, um, yeah. But some people might say, yeah, there was a sense of daring in, in trying to do something different. And I applaud you for that because every step towards bringing a more diverse and open side of extending the narrative of coaching is going to help not just our industry okay. but the people that have different narratives in the way they approach things so it is beautiful well done thank you it's 2021 what do you think that future of coaching will look like well one thing a tendency we see already and we can I think anticipate that we will see more of that is the institutionalization yeah. of coaching. Yeah. I started as a coach. Um, we were practitioners who started coaching. And uh, I remember in 1999, there was the first executive coaching summit. Some of the people at the time um, were there discussing what the future of coaching is going to be. And one thing was to to ensure that it would be recognized as something legitimate yeah. and that we would see one day universities taking on coaching. We would see programs uh, um, in universities, research in coaching, and that has happened. Actually, yes. you see now some of the yeah. best universities have coaching programs. You can have a master in coaching, a PhD yeah. in coaching. Yeah. You, there, are more, there is more research in coaching. I've been fortunate to, to do this seminar I mentioned to you at the University of Cambridge, and I will do this again next year. Uh, but Cambridge wasn't doing any coaching 20, 30 years ago, I don't think. Mm. Um, so mm. in the future, I think we will see more of that, more research. But what I do hope to see is coaching permeating education, not just universities, but also high schools, and primary schools as well. I think, you know, in high schools, in primary schools, kids learn a lot of great stuff about mathematics, uh, about their language, about science. But I think it would be useful for people to learn about how do I build constructive relationship with people? How do mm. I make the most of differences? How can I be um, live a healthy life, uh, being yeah. fit in yes. my life? How can I live a more purposeful life? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and all that, I don't know about uh, uh, Australia, <laughs> Mel, uh, but I, in Belgium, this is not being taught yet. And in many countries, okay. I, I've seen uh, there's still a long way to go. So yeah. I think that would be the future of one, one aspect of the future yes. of coaching is that it would permeate society overall. Mm. And another aspect and I'm going to repeat what I've said is we would see a more global form of coaching. Mm. One, an integrated form of coaching where a realization that coaching can be informed from almost any discipline, can be informed from a, a variety of disciplines. And so the coaching yeah. is a, a field at the intersection of many mm. different fields. Absolutely. Again, uh, the global coaching I talk about um, range, we, we address a, a physical perspective, spiritual perspective, political, yeah. cultural, psychological, uh, managerial, different perspectives that could inform it. I think that will be the future I see. I mean, there are a lot of more things we can anticipate, yeah. but uh, that would be my hope. Thank you. Thank you. That is also my hope. I have this saying, we need to see a democratization of coaching and that as you say in your words beautifully, that it will permeate into society, especially in the important segments like education, you know, with our young, our new generation coming in. I love that. Part of this coaching, global coaching, uh, the spiritual perspective is not to be about mm. being purposeful. In the world uh, today, yeah. promoting sustainability is so essential. So yes. part of this so. will be to help promote a more sustainable world. We need yeah. this. This is not a luxury. And global coaching helps to, to achieve that. And if we can uh, train people early on, so we will, as you say, help to build a new generation that will be taking better care of our planet, <laughs> the people, and all living species on the planet.
And you and I know that there are coaches walking in right now, new ones and future ones. What would be your master wisdom? You've already shared quite a few that you want to particularly address to the new ones coming in. I would say the, the one piece of wisdom is don't look for just one piece of wisdom. Um, <laughs> you know, don't, don't look for that one tip or that one model. Uh, an invitation to embark on a lifelong journey. To Beautiful. take your time, to be curious, to learn from different people, different models, different perspectives. And, mm. and uh, so that will be uh, more challenging, but it will also be more exciting for you. Yeah. So that might be. Yeah. Beautiful. And this is often our last question, Philippe. Um, as coaches, we ask powerful questions. So what mm -hmm. will be your question to leave behind with the audience in general? How can you become the unique coach you are? <laughs> How can you become the unique coach you are? Suggesting that there isn't just one way to be a, a coach. And that connects also with this supervision approach that I've developed. I call it integrative coaching supervision. Mm -hmm. And this is about avoiding forming clones, you know, all the same, <laughs> yes, in the same way, but inviting you to be this unique yeah. coach. Deploy yeah. your multifaceted potential in your yeah. unique way. Mm. And by the way, I mean, I wrote an article on this topic. All this is on my website, uh, freely accessible. I have a number of articles there. And one is about this integrative coaching supervision approach. Beautiful. And this is the time where I invite you, Philip, to share how we can get in touch with you. Right? And, and also share your upcoming uh, events, please. One easy way is I have a website, philrosinski.com, P-H-I-L-R-O-S-I-N-S-K-I.com. Mm. And there, I think you can, you, you can uh, subscribe to, there is a mailing list that also gives you access to these articles. You have my email there as well, so you can contact me personally. And you, you, there is an event section so you, where you can see about our upcoming programs, seminars. So that's one way. I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn and you can easily find me. Uh, my, um, I think my pseudo is Phil Rosinski, but if you type my name, Philip Rosinski, yeah. I don't think there are too many of us uh, with <laughs> this same first name and last name. You yeah. can find me and that's also a good way to connect. There is a Facebook page as well, but you, you can find this um, on my website. Uh, but the website, LinkedIn, and then there is a Facebook page would be a good way. Wonderful. Any last thoughts before we go? Well, it's a pleasure to, to speak with you, Mel. I really appreciate your... Uh, pleasure, Mel. Um, your curiosity, your uh, demonstrating of I do I was talking about, your sense of connection here, uh, and these interviews that help to, to promote a variety of approaches in coaching. So thank you for doing this. Thank you for all of you who are listening to us. I'm sorry I cannot see you, but I wish you all the very best and encourage you to continue on your journeys and to promote coaching in the interest of people we work with yeah. as well as uh, the world in general and you heard it first here on the 100 master coaches show this is philip and mel signing off until we see you on the next one bye for now <laughs> thank you mel thank you bye bye You have been watching the 100 Master Coaches series with your host, Coach Mel, MCC. Brought to you by Catalyst Coach. www.catalystcoach.line We will be right back with our next Master Coach on the 100 Master Coaches series.